Well, welcome everyone. I'm really pleased that you're all here. This is a great showing. I'm very excited about that. And so I'll introduce myself. I'm Greg Goodland, the Public Affairs Officer for the Rio Grande National Forest and uh, one of the partners and hosts of tonight's Forest Specialist Series. Um, welcome everybody and uh, looking forward to having a great presentation by our new fisheries biologist. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Kelly Defy, who is showing up on your screen as San Juan Mountains Association, our partner and uh, co-host for tonight. Yeah, so we're just going to do a little bit of housework or housekeeping. Just everybody, if you could stay on mute unless you're asking a question. If you do have a question, you can raise your hand by hovering your mouse down over the reactions and while well, clicking on the reactions and there's a little raised hand thing you can put click on uh, or you can put it in the chat. We'll be watching the chat too. Um, What else? Oh, the door prize. This month we have a book called Colorado San Juan Mountains. It's a it's a photography book. It's got some old pictures. It's got some new pictures. It's kind of a pretty book that I thought would be nice to have. Uh, and a bookmark, Advice from a River. So if you'd like to have your name in the drawing for the chat or for the prize, put your name in the chat. Also, if you'd like to be on our list for the upcoming for a specialist series on our email list, you can do that by putting your name. Um, you can send it to me by hovering your or by clicking on the drop down menu over the everyone in the chat box and then picking the San Juan Mountains Association, I believe is the one that's me. I don't remember which one's me. But it's like the one that's not a name. So anyway, you can send you send me your email if you want to be on any upcoming um email lists. And other than that, I think it's time for Rosalie to take it away. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. And thank you again for joining us. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and get my presentation started. Alrighty, so I will just go ahead and jump right into this presentation. Tonight I'm going to be speaking about restoring our headwater streams on the Rio Grande National Forest. Um, again, my name is Rosalie Reese and I'm the forest fisheries biologist here on the Rio Grande National Forest. So just a brief outline of what I'm going to speak about this evening. I'm going to start off with just a little background information on what headwater streams actually are, and then follow that up with the need for some restoration efforts. And then I'm going to jump into um, beaver on the Rio Grande National Forest, followed by some information on low-tech process-based restoration, and then finish up with uh, some information on education and outreach and our partnership that makes all of this work possible. So just to start, and many of you may know this, but I think it's really important background information um, for the rest of this presentation, is just to cover what are headwater streams. So headwater streams um, are just the small streams and wetlands that are at the highest end of a watershed. So you see this um, kind of info picture and kind of shows what a watershed would look like. And you can see up towards the top of the photo, the headwaters portion of that. So the, the highest extent of the watershed. And here in the Rio Grande um, National Forest, that's going to be predominantly up, um, up in the mountains, in the San Juan Mountains and in the Sangre de Cristos, where we have all this, these small stream networks. And this can include streams, springs, seeps, wetlands, wet meadows, riparian corridors. These are all different terms that you're gonna hear that are kind of different components of these headwater streams. And it's really important to recognize that the majority of our aquatic resources um, in the U.S., the majority of our stream networks are headwater streams. So 79% of all of our kind of aquatic resources, um, our stream networks are considered headwater streams. So the vast majority, um, and especially on the Rio Grande National Forest, um, our headwaters are supporting the Rio Grande River in the San Luis Valley downstream. And then, of course, you know, downstream into New Mexico and Texas and beyond. So why are headwaters important? 
Um, and I want to introduce the kind of the concept of ecosystem services. And, and this long list here is kind of all the different ecosystem services that headwaters provide for us. So an ecosystem service is just a, it's a benefit that we get from an ecosystem, as simple as that. And so you can see that there's, this isn't even an exhaustive list, but there's a, a long list of different ecosystem services that come from our headwater systems. Um, things like fisheries habitat, something I'm very concerned with as a fish biologist here at the forest. So we're um, talking about things like Rio Grande cutthroat conservation and also recreational fisheries. Um, water quality, so our headwaters help to catch sediment and filter water as the water moves downstream. Um, our headwaters provide some wildfire resiliency, and so wildfire has definitely been um, has been devastating to the Rio Grande National Forest in the past and national forests throughout the western U.S. So having healthy headwater systems um, uh, gives us buffers to wildfire and acts as refugia habitat for wildlife during wildfire events. Um, our headwaters are biodiversity hotspots. They're very important for wildlife habitat. Lots of different species come into our riparian corridors and our aquatic resources. Um, and they're also used as dispersal corridors. So wildlife use these riparian corridors and these stream networks to move across the landscape. Our headwaters help to sustain our aquifers. So you probably all know that most of our water comes from snow melt up in the mountains. And so as our snow melts and during the spring um, runoff season, our headwater streams really allow that water to percolate down into the water table and, and allow groundwater recharge to happen and flood protection. So our headwater systems and this complex of wet meadows and wetlands um, and riparian veg vegetation slow the water down and catch debris and, and um, protect downwater or down, uh, downstream users from floods. So, and like I said, this isn't even an exhaustive list, but there's many different reasons why our headwaters are important and why we're so concerned with um, protecting and enhancing them on the Rio Grande National Forest. And kind of just to hit home the Rio Grande cutthroat point a little bit more, since I am the fish biologist here, I wanted to show this map a little bit dated coming from 2016, but most of this information is still relatively current. Just showing the distribution of Rio Grande cutthroat populations. And you'll see the portion that's in Colorado is predominantly the Rio Grande National Forest. And you can see the network of streams. The blue is the historic distribution and the red is the conservation populations that existed in 2016, which is relatively similar to the populations that are current now in 2024. So you can see that much of the distribution of Rio Grande cutthroat has been lost and that the, the, all of the Rio Grande cutthroat conservation populations are, are um, subsisting in these headwater streams. And so very important to recognize that if we wanna have Rio Grande cutthroat on our forests for long-term, um, then we need to protect these headwater systems. So now I kind of wanna get into this concept of um, a, a wet meadow. Um, and up in our headwater systems, we have a lot of these wet meadow complexes, um, you'll hear it called, or wet meadow system. And basically this is a, you know, as you have a stream that's moving down from um, the, from a higher gradient from the mountains and you'll reach this kind of high alpine valley or a high alpine meadow. And here you have the stream moving through that meadow system. And this um, info picture here kind of shows a lot of those ecosystem services that I was talking about earlier. So we have the stream meandering through this low gradient, low gradient meadow. Um, we have a lot of riparian vegetation along the stream. We have a diverse mosaic of habitats, both in stream and along the riparian corridor. The water has slowed down and it's able to percolate into the water table to um, allow for groundwater recharge. Um, and so overall, we're just we're getting a lot of those um, ecosystem services. This healthy, wet meadow system up in the mountains is providing all of these services for us. And this is really what we want to see. Unfortunately, we have a lot of instances throughout the Southwest, throughout the Western U.S., and on the Rio Grande National Forest where we've had some degradation to our headwater streams, to our wet meadow systems. And so this is just kind of shows what can happen when we get some of that degradation. 
um, you'll see that the stream has really started to down cut. Um, there's a lot of erosion happening, a lot of stream banks, instability. We've lost our connectivity to the floodplain. So now when a flood moves through the system, the water moves very quickly. We don't get that overbank flow like we would have in the um, previous healthy meadow system. We're losing a lot of the groundwater recharge. We have a very incised channel that's not able to connect with the floodplain. We've lost a lot of our riparian vegetation. And so when we have these degraded, unhealthy wet meadow systems, we really have lost a lot of those ecosystem services that we depend on. So what can we do about it? How can we restore our headwater streams and wet meadows? And on the Rio Grande National Forest, we are approaching this kind of um, with two different methodologies, two different tools. And the first one I will talk about is beaver, and the second will be low-tech process-based restoration. So beaver. Beaver are a keystone species and an ecosystem engineer. And so what this means is that they have kind of a disproportionate impact on the habitat around them. They're really able to build an ecosystem around them. They kind of hold the system together and define the entire ecosystem. And they're able to modify, create, and destroy habitat. And so I'm sure you've seen beaver, um, beaver dam complexes, beaver lodges on the landscape and their ability to modify the habitat around them, create, excuse me, create wetlands, create wet meadows, um, allow riparian vegetation to recruit and, uh, and basically create these wet meadow, um, these high alpine wet meadow systems that provide so many of those ecosystem services that we're concerned with. And there's been a lot of attention given to beaver in the last several decades. The beaver populations in the U.S. used to be much, much higher. Um, they were nearly trapped out in the um, 1800s and early 1900s. The populations have started to rebound, but um, there's still, you know, there's still a lot fewer than they used to be. And now there's a lot of research on, you know, what we're missing from our landscape when we don't have beavers and the impacts that beaver can have when they're present. So I just wanted to kind of showcase some of the research that's been coming out about beaver in the last couple decades. Beaver, nature's ecosystem engineers. Beaver, the North American Freshwater Climate Action Plan. Beaver pond geomorphology influences pond nitrogen retention and denitrification. So these are all examples of just people that are kind of delving into how beaver impact the landscape and kind of trying to understand a lot of the beneficial impacts we can expect when we have them. And this is another example that I think just really hits home something that's um, very pertinent to the Southwest and to the Rio Grande National Forest is wildfire. So this um, paper came out um, Smokey the beaver, beaver dammed riparian corridors stay green during wildfire throughout Western United States. So they basically ex as assessed how riparian corridors that contained beaver populations um, were able to subsist during wildfire. And you can see in this image, um, you know, you can see the beaver dam down at the bottom of the photo, a big ponded area, a really wide riparian corridor with lots of lush riparian vegetation, and everything else is pretty much a moonscape. And so because there were beaver on this landscape, we have this kind of resilient refugia that's going to allow things to survive during wildfire and hopefully regenerate a lot faster. So here's kind of an example um, of just how this process works when a beaver moves on to a landscape. And this um, I, it, picture I borrowed from the Colorado Riparian Association. So kind of starting up in the left-hand corner with A, we have a, a pretty degraded incised stream, um, not a lot of floodplain connectivity, not a lot of riparian vegetation, but a beaver decides to move in and builds a few dams. So then we have a flood that moves through the system. And in image B, we see the beaver dams have been blown out during a high flow event. But, you know, the stream channel has widened a little bit. We have a little bit of vegetation moving in. There's a little bit more heterogeneity of habitat. And then in C, the beaver rebuilds the dams. Okay, and so now the water tables come up a little bit. We're dealing with a little bit of the erosion and stream incision. We're getting more uh, riparian vegetation recruited. 
We're seeing that in D, maybe they blow out again. In E, they rebuild. And so it's kind of this iterative process. It's obviously not going to happen overnight, but over time, you know, you get to something like E or F where the riparian corridor has like quadrupled in size and there's all of these different habitats. There's side channels and pools and all this riparian vegetation and we're reconnected to the floodplain. So you can see how a beaver could take a degraded wet meadow in A and, and re regenerate it um, all the way back to something like F and restore all those ecosystem services that are so beneficial to us. And here's just a couple pictures. Um, these are not from our forest and borrowed these photos, but they just show the, the stark difference in, um, the, in a stream system with beaver and without. So this area of the stream um, doesn't have any active beaver colonies. You'll see the riparian corridor is very narrow. You could imagine a wildfire burning through here and just jumping over that stream channel. Um, it still does meander quite a bit and the erosion hasn't gotten too extreme in this area, but there is starting to be some down cutting and some um, stream bank erosion. But then just upstream of this, where you have a beaver colony, you see this big beaver dam. You've got really, really lush riparian vegetation, a super wide um, riparian corridor, side channels, all different types of habitat. Um, so just again, kind of a very stark difference when there's beaver on the landscape. So what are we doing on the forest? We now have kind of explained to you why beaver, why we think beaver are so important and why we want them on our landscape, up in our headwaters. So how are we assessing this? So on the, on the Rio Grande National Forest, um, we are conducting beaver surveys to determine the presence and absence and abundance of beaver on the forest. And this is actually part of our forest plan monitoring. So monitoring for beaver is in our um, forest plan. And we're doing this just as, you know, the, the Fish and Wildlife and Watershed staff, as well as nonprofit partners, just getting out on the landscape and collecting data on where beaver are, where beaver aren't, and maybe areas that would be suitable for beaver that where they aren't right now. And there's also an effort to do this through citizen science. So we have an app that you can download on your phone. And then when you're out hiking around or ATVing or where, however you might be recreating out on the forest, if you see um, you know, indicators of beaver or an active beaver lodge, you can actually collect that data. And that's very, very helpful for the forest in our beaver survey effort. So at the end, I'll share my contact information. And if anyone is inter um, interested in that, please get in touch with me. So kind of another part of our beaver efforts um, is an actual beaver relocation program. So this is in partnership with the Rio Grande Headwaters Restoration Project and the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. And we are actually relocating beavers onto the forest. So, you know, we're going to go out and determine where there might be appropriate locations for beaver. And I'll go into that a little bit more. Then we're working with APHIS to actually trap what we nuisance or pest beavers. So beavers that are down usually, you know, in the San Luis Valley that are causing conflict with agricultural production or infrastructure or causing flooding. We humanely trap those beavers. We quarantine them per CPW guidelines to reduce risk of disease and pest translocation. And then we release the beavers into remote watersheds on the Rio Grande National Forest where they can live out their days. And this is actually a photo of a beaver that we released um, in 2023. So how do we determine where it is suitable to release beaver? We don't wanna just be releasing them anywhere. We wanna put some thought into this make sure that the beaver have a good chance of survival and that we're not gonna be causing any um, additional conflicts. So one tool we have is called the Beaver Restoration Assessment Tool or the BRAT tool. Um, and this is a model that actually takes into uh, consideration a lot of different parameters that are important for um, to be able to determine if a stream can um, support a beaver population. And I'll give you a zoomed in version of this so you can kind of see the detail a little more. So here we're down on the Quinejos and you can see all of these different stream segments are coded in different colors. So blue is pervasive dam building capacity all the way down to red, which is zero dam building, dam building capacity. And so basically what this model does is it takes into consideration things like stream gradient, riparian vegetation, um, water flow, and determines whether, you know, in a model, um, whether it predicts that that segment of stream can support a beaver population. 
So this gives us a starting place. We can look at this and say, okay, this, you know, this area looks like it could potentially um, support beaver. So then we're going to follow that up with a field survey. We're going to head out to the stream. We're going to assess whether we think that this stream can support a beaver population or not. We're going to verify that it's not going to cause conflicts with grazing permittees or other land use. We're going to make sure that it's in line with CPW's um, fisheries management goals for that stream. We're going to make sure it's not going to cause conflict with infrastructure. And so that's how, you know, it's a, it's a pretty long process and um, a thorough process to make sure that the areas that we are releasing beaver are going to be suitable for them. And let's see if this video will play. Here we go. So this is actually a beaver that we released in 2023. And this was my first release, so I struggled with the trap a little bit. But uh, we did actually release 13 beavers in 2023. There he goes, off to a happy home. And you can kind of see in the background on the left side of this video, there's kind of a, it just kind of looks like a pile of willows. So that's actually kind of a what we call a beaver hut. So we will go out to the site before we release the beaver and kind of build them a little shelter and maybe start a food cache for them just so that they have a place to kind of scurry off to as soon as they get released. Um, and again, this work is in partnership with APHIS and the Rio Grande Headwaters Restoration Project and was funded by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. So I know that beaver can be contentious and they can cause conflicts. And so I did want to just touch on some of the common conflicts, but also share some potential solutions with everyone tonight. Um, I'd like you to consider that if you have reoccurring conflicts with beaver on, a, on your property or a property where you graze or, you know, whatever you might use it for, the likelihood is, is that if you trap or kill or remove the beavers from that property, from that area, if you have suitable habitat for beaver, the likelihood is that a beaver will recolonize that area and you will end up having additional conflicts with beaver in the future. So if you're able to kind of use some of these various methods to live harmoniously with beaver, hopefully you can get some of the ecosystem services that they provide for us and also, you know, save your trees, protect your infrastructure and prevent flooding. And I've listed a couple of organizations here, the National Beaver Institute, the National Beaver Working Groups, Colorado Beaver Working Group. And these are all resources that have really great guides and um, you know, other types of resources can put you in contact with um, beaver professionals that can help you mitigate some of the conflicts you have with beavers. So if you're interested in this, um, I would encourage you to do some research or reach out to me um, or other partners that are doing this work in the Valley because we can help you hopefully find um, some solutions to the conflicts. Because we all know that beaver can be very industrious and when they're in a spot that's causing you conflict, it can be quite the headache. And we definitely understand that and want to work towards solutions for that. But that being said, there are going to be times when beaver is just not appropriate for the landscape. There's going to be areas where it just doesn't make sense to have beaver. So what can we do to restore our headwater streams and our wet meadows where we don't put beaver? Luckily, we have this other tool that we've been using, um, which is called low-tech low -tech process-based restoration or LTPBR. So what is LTPBR? Um, it's the practice of using simple, low unit cost structural additions like wood, sod, or rock to riverscapes to mimic functions and initiate specific processes. And the key here really is that initiate specific processes. Basically, what we're trying to do is kind of jumpstart the stream um, and reinitiate some of these processes that then restore the stream and restore those ecosystem services. There are cost-effective and low-tech treatments. These are all hand-built, natural materials, non-engineered. They're short, they have a short lifespan, usually three to five years. And kind of the motto is let the system do the work. Again, we're gonna go in, put in some restoration structures, reinitiate those processes, and then let the river take on the work. And there's many different types of structures, and I'll get into this a little bit more, but beaver dam analogs, BDAs, post-assisted log structures or PALs, Zuni bowls, one rock dams, and many others that fall into this um, umbrella of LTPBR. 
And really, they all kind of do, um, you know, slightly different things. And you're able to choose the structure type based on the restoration needs. So whether it's erosion or stream bank stability, um, uh, habitat diversity, whatever it might be, there's a different structure kind of to meet those different needs. And I think it's really important to um, acknowledge that we have some really important legislation that was introduced and signed in 2023 called Colorado Senate Bill 270 or SB 270. And this directly relates to the type of work that we're doing, this LTPBR work. And so this is relating to projects that restore natural stream systems, and it's concerning these activities that restore environmental health of natural stream systems. And um, a key component of this is that it applies to stream restoration projects that are limited to minor restoration activities and the projects that have attained any applicable permits. Um, and I won't get into the details of this right now, but um, if you're interested, please reach out. And there's really, really great trainings on how SB 270 works. But just to say the LTPBR work that we're doing on the forest falls within the scope of SB 270, which basically says that we don't have to administer any water rights um, and that the um, structures that we're putting in do not have an impact on the water, street, water rights or the downstream water users. And that will become more clear as I show you what these structures look like and what they're doing on the landscape. So here's a cross section of a, just a generic BDA structure. Um, so the top shows the cross section. We've pounded these log or wooden posts into the stream bed. It's stream spanning from bank to bank. We're only going to put these um, up to kind of this mean annual flood height or the ordinary high water mark. And that's a designation that comes right out of that state bill 270. So we're not building up anything past the ordinary high water mark. Um, and then the lower view kind of from the top shows after you have um, put the posts in, then you're going to come back through. You're going to weave in woody vegetation like willow and aspen. You might add rock and sod and sand and basically build this semi-permeable dam structure um, across the stream, a beaver dam analog, just kind of like what it sounds like. So here's another image that kind of shows how these function in the stream. You've got the beaver dam analog going across the stream. And from the introduction of that beaver dam analog, we've got pooling water up ahead of the structure. We've got a plunge pool, um, great aeration coming from this plunge pool, great for fish. We've got a lot of different heterogeneity of habitats. We've got some shallow inundated vegetation over here, which is great um, nursery habitat for larval fish. We've got water that's been slowed down so it's able to recharge. We've got all this riparian vegetation coming back. We've got gravel deposition. So again, showing a lot of those ecosystem services that are coming back to the landscape with the introduction of this BDA. And here's a few photos of some BDAs we've built on the forest. This is a structure with just the posts in before we've actually weaved the vegetation. And here it is with the vegetation added. So this is the final structure. And you can see the water's flowing through the structure. Um, it's barely impeded at all. You know, it's slowed down a little bit here, but still flowing right through the structure. And in time, you know, this might catch, this will catch more sediment, catch debris, and hopefully back up the water a little bit more, connect to that floodplain, and kind of reinitiate those processes. Here's another example of um, some structures we built in the fall of last year. You can see the BDA here on the right hand side <clears throat> of the picture close to, um, looks like maybe some napping technicians taking their lunch. Um, and this is a great example here. On the right side, you had the stream channel just kind of flowing down this single channel. We put that BDA in and everything on the left side of the photo, all of that water you can see um, is now coming over the bank and inundating the floodplain because that BDA is there. And this is the same BDA, just a different viewpoint. You can see this, the original stream channel on the right flowing down. And then over on the left, we have all of these places where the water is flowing over the floodplain and reconnecting. And here's an aerial view of some BDAs we built. These were built in 2022, actually. There's three, one, two, and three kind of spread out across the picture. And um, 
you know, kind of the same thing. We're just seeing a creation of different types of habitat. Um, we're seeing water flooding over the bank here and all this riparian vegetation recruitment. And the BDA to the far right of this um, photo is actually one that um, a beaver has taken over um, maintenance of that dam and has started to build that dam up and had a food cache there in the fall of 2023. And so that's really what we want to see. We want to go in and, you know, put these initial structures in, but then if a beaver can come in and maintain those and do the work for us, that's great because they are industrious creatures. So just a quick touch on a couple other different types of LTPBR structures, because they can be very different. This is kind of an infogram of um, what's called a Zuni bowl. Um, basically an area that you might have a really um, steep head cut or really bad erosion. You can come in and kind of armor that whole eroded area with rock um, and create this kind of armored pool so that when the water plunges over, it doesn't continue to degrade and erode the area. It's, um, and then you kind of create um, this splash apron and a one rock dam. And this really helps to prevent that head cut from getting any worse and to create a diversity of habitats and stabilize the area. So this is an example of a Zuni bull type structure we built last fall. Um, we've armored this whole area with rock that we just found around the drainage. Um, originally, there was a lot of erosion happening here, which was carrying a lot of sediment downstream to Rio Grande cutthroat stream. So we were hoping to kind of help with the water quality in this system. And the cool thing about this is that as water flows over this structure, it's going to slow down because of the rock and the um, friction with this. It's going to slow the water down. And as the water slows down, it's going to drop a lot of the sediment that it's carrying. And it's going to start to fill in all of those interstitial spaces between the rocks. And in three to five years, this whole thing will be filled in with sediment. It'll be holding water in the system and it'll be recruiting riparian vegetation. And you won't even be able to tell it's there. So one more quick example of another type of structure um, called one rock dams. And usually you kind of install these into the stream um, in a series. So here you can see, you know, there's four different one rock dams. And um, again, it's just kind of creating that, um, that slowdown of the water, creating a little bit of habitat diversity um, and creating these deposition zones where the water slows down and it drops that sediment and overall just kind of helping that system become a little more natural. Um, and, you know, the last thing we want is for water to just shoot down a stream as quick as it can, eroding everything as it goes. So this can kind of help with that issue. And so that's kind of a brief overview of the LTPBR work that we've been doing on the forest. And just kind of to wrap up now, I just wanted to briefly touch on our education and outreach component to all of this. Um, it's really important to us that we share the work we're doing for restoring our headwaters and our wet meadow systems. Um, we've been working a lot with SEC crews and volunteers and um, local youth to share the work we're doing to talk about the importance of our headwaters. Um, we're all downstream, you know, if we're in the San Luis Valley, we're all downstream users and our headwaters are really a, an incredible resource for the Rio Grande River for everyone that lives in the valley, for our agricultural production. And so it's really important to spread this information so that people understand what a valuable resource this is. So here we are actually with some Del Mar High School students out on the Rio. We take them out to do a snorkel program and talk about aquatic ecology and water quality and fisheries. And um, so that's a really fun program as well as taking kids out to the Beaver Creek area to sample macroinvertebrates and again, talk about water quality and the importance of our headwaters. And finally, I just wanted to briefly touch on how important partnership and collaboration is to this work. Um, nothing that I've talked about tonight is done in silo. We work with partners on every facet of this work, um, you know, whether it's with the Rio Grande Headwaters Restoration Project, um, helping us gain funding and manage these projects, um, you know, working with Department of Natural Resources, DWR, and the Colorado Water Conservation Board, our APHIS trappers coordinating this work with CPW, funding from NIFWF, 
all of these different partners, um, you know, we're all involved in this work and we're all very excited to be doing it and I'm excited to share this information with you tonight. And so with that, I will wrap it up and um, just invite questions. Here's my email and my work phone number. So if you do want to follow up with me about anything I've discussed tonight, um, I welcome that and yeah, we'll take any questions. See, just check in the chat to see if there's any questions there. I'm not seeing anything in the chat, but Rosalie, um, have you done any of the introductory introducing beavers on the upper Rio Grande? So above above Del Norte up to Creed or the reservoir? Um uh, let's see. Most of the stuff we have done, I'm trying to think. I don't think we've done we have we definitely haven't done anything above above Rio Grande Reservoir. Um We've done quite a bit on down on the Canejas Peak District, um, but no, I'm pretty, no, we haven't. I'm not that I'm aware of done anything up there. Um, we did. We only relocated one beaver in 2022, and then we did 13 in 2023. So um, we will continue that effort this year, and we will probably rel relocate beavers to areas that we've tried once and they didn't necessarily take. We might try again or we will look for additional areas as well. So if you ever have an, an idea of a place you think they might be a good fit, um, we're open to those ideas. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's see, just looking in the chat. Question, Rosalie? Mm -hmm. Do you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, Randy Gormley and Del Norte, former employee on the Rio Grande National Forest and Wildlife Fisheries Program lead. Um, what is occurring with the boreal toad, which is a very uh, unique and kind of fits between the uh, cracks sometimes in the conservation concern species? Um, there's very little, if anything, in the current forest plan, the new forest plan. I noticed that the G mug had uh, put in oh several uh, at least guidelines in their plan that can be used and probably would fit on the Rio Grande. And so my question is, um, you know, who is that falling into your program or the wildlife program? If there are still wildlife folks out there doing stuff. Um, um, yeah, a little of both. So boreal toad is definitely on my radar and also the wildlife biologist at the forest. And that's one reason we are quarantining beaver before we release them is because we want to make sure to not sped, spread um, chytrid on the forest, which has been one of the prominent reasons that boreal toad have, populations have um, almost been completely wiped out in this area. And so that's definitely something that we want to take into consideration with this program. We work pretty closely with the native aquatic um, species biologist, CPW, Dan Kamek. And um, so he's kind of directly, um, you know, sampling for chytrid and um, monitoring the boreal toad populations on the forest. But myself and um, the wildlife biologists do coordinate with him and we will be going out um, this season to sample the populations that we have on the forest, which unfortunately are very few. Is there any reporting on that or where the public can find information on those results? Um, you know, I'm not 100% positive on that. Um, if it were in our forest plan, then it would go into our forest monitoring questions to some extent. I would think the best bet is probably reporting done by CPW They because they kind of house the data for that. And I'm not sure where you would locate that, but I could um, inquire for sure. Okay, thank you. It looks like there's a question in the chat from Shauna. Has anything been done on the Navajo reservation? Um, not that I'm aware of, all of the work that we're doing is on Rio Grande National Forest lands. Um, some of the partner organizations that we work with do work with other land partners, but I'm not for sure on the Navajo reservation aspect of that. 
And then Jeffrey asked, what food base is best for relocating beavers? Um, so beaver really love young aspen. That's one of their favorite foods, as well as willows. So those are kind of the two big things. They will eat a lot of other, you know, kind of woody species. But willow and aspen are the two that we are um, looking for when we're surveying for suitable locations for beaver. Hey, Rosalie, uh, maybe scroll back up in that uh, chat real quick. And uh, somebody brings okay. up uh, about the Wheeler survey uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, I'm, I'm curious if that person's still on, if they might be able to come on and, and uh, just talk a little more of what they're bringing up. I'm, I'm curious what the connection here is. Hi, I'm Scott. Um just got interested in the Wheeler survey because they had a lot of photographs from the 1874 survey uh, of west of the 100th meridian. And there are a number of different surveys that went out, but the Wheeler was one of them. And they came through the Canaeus River Valley and through the San Luis Valley uh, mm -hmm. and ended up going down I think toward Taos. Anyway, when they came in, came up the San Luis River Valley, uh, Timothy Sullivan, who was a Civil War photographer, famous for his photo photographs in the Civil War, also was kind of famous for his land, became famous for his landscape photography. Uh, Ansel Adams had. Uh, been introduced to some of his photographs, uh, glass plate photographs, and uh, said these need to be preserved. And so, uh, largely due to Ansel Adams, a lot of the Sullivan's uh, survey photographs have been preserved. Uh, anyway, they came through in 1874, and the thing I noticed about some of the things uh, Spectacle Lake, which is a small pond, really, <clears throat> was named Beaver Beaver Lake or Beaver Pond uh, in the photographs. And uh, then the other one was Beaver Park Valley on the Conejos, which is about, uh, which is directly below the confluence of the uh, South Fork and the, and the uh, uh, part of the Conejos coming down from Potoro and just kind of a broad valley there. But it just <clears throat> really impacted me to think that they would name that area Beaver Park uh, without, uh, it just seemed like they had to have reason and maybe there were uh, quite an uh, quite a few beaver in that area. Yeah, that's interesting. It's it's very interesting to look at historical beaver populations and just how prolific they were. Um, and it's hard to imagine what the landscape looked like when there were that many beaver. There must have been just so much water. It probably would have been impassable in a lot of the places that we go now. But um, thank you for sharing that. Super interesting. I'd love to look into that a little bit more and check out some of those photos. I saw you shared one, so hopefully I can try to pull that up later. Um, I did see one other question is uh, from Jenny. Is relocation limited to headwater streams? Um, the short answer is no. Um, for, the, for the Rio Grande National Forest, most of our systems are headwaters, so that's kind of where we're working. Um, it is also uh, often where we can find areas that there is not a lot of conflict for beaver relocation. So, you know, if we can put beavers up in the wilderness where they can just do their thing and not conflict with other land uses or um, other people using the land, then that's really wonderful. But there are definitely people down in the San Luis Valley or, you know, other areas that just want to have beaver on their properties. And, um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of momentum for this work right now, a lot of research happening, um, a lot of um, this beaver translocation efforts happening. And so if people are interested in having beaver on their properties, 
there are definitely ways to achieve that and it is not limited to just the headwater systems. Hey, Rosalie, can I just uh, ask a question that kind of builds on that too? Um, so if I was interested in, in putting a beaver on my property and uh, say my neighbor right there downstream wasn't, um, mm -hmm. how, how would they um, work that out? Yeah, that's where the conflict arises, right? Um, <laughs> and that can be touchy. You know, water rights get involved, infrastructure gets involved, private lands get involved. And so it can be really a delicate um, a delicate balance to achieve something like that. We're very lucky that as the forest, we have all of these remote watersheds. And, um, you know, I don't think I can necessarily speak to exactly how you accomplish that, but you would definitely want to get involved with you know, DWR and CPW and make sure that you're talking to all the different, you know, organizations that would be involved in translocating that beaver to make sure that it would be acceptable. Um, I think there is a path forward for situations like that, but it does take, you know, just working through those details. Totally, Vegan. thanks. And uh, or, go ahead Rose and put, one second, Kelly. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and put in the chat, as I mentioned at the beginning of the um, session here, folks, uh, the, um, what is it called? Community Connections on the Rappel and Roosevelt National Forest, uh, similar online uh, engagement sessions like this. So that's coming in there now. And um, Kelly, take it away. Um, well, I just wanted to ask, Tegan has a question. Is there a need for beaver breeding programs? Hmm, interesting question. Um, not in the San Luis Valley. We're lucky that we have lots of beaver. Um, you know, beaver really love low gradient systems. And so there's a lot of beaver down in the San Luis Valley that are considered nuisance or pests that people want to get rid of. So we are in, you know, we have a supply of beaver um, to relocate. I could see in other areas where maybe they aren't as prolific. Um, you could foresee needing something like that. But I think Colorado, even just with how many um, mountains we have and how, you know, how much water, how many water resources we have, that um, there's plenty of beaver to go around. And luckily they are prolific breeders as well. So um, plenty of beaver here. Well, I'll give it the long, awkward pause for a second while folks are considering last minute questions. Um, I worked in rangeland management on the Gunnison Ranger District many years ago, and uh, I did some restoration projects uh, in that coach dope country, so fairly close to here. And I got to tell you, um, the 25 years down the road, we're seeing uh, amazing results of that restoration that we started way back then. And I, I just think, you know, what you guys are doing with your partners, Rosalie, is just amazing. And I know our kids for sure are going to be reaping the benefits of it. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I see a, several people on here that I could put in that uh, a pot to say thanks for all that hard work. <laughs> How about that? Any last minute questions for Rosalie? I think if not, uh, certainly feel free to come on, put it in the chat, whatever. But if not, we're going to hand it over to Kelly to see who won our cool prize book. All right. Well, it was Charlie Lanier this time around. So, Charlie, if you will put your address into a chat to me, I will get that sent out to you. So, uh, and other than that, I mean... Maybe talk about next month. We're doing wildfire, and yeah, if you got your if you got your email in to me, or yeah, if you wanted to be on the email ad list, just let me know. It's been awesome seeing the interest that people have. People are so excited to like get on the email list. It's pretty awesome. So, and, and Kelly, you reminded me. Uh, I'm missing on my job here. I'm promoting <laughs> my uh, neighbor and my partner for us, the Rappahoe Roosevelt. And Pawnee Grasslands, and I forgot to tell you when our next one is. So if you'll bear with me for a few more seconds, it's coming up on my screen here. 
Um, we are going to have on April 24th, our new fire management officer, Doug Curry, will be presenting on wildfire. And he's going to do kind of the gamut of things that will uh, talk about getting ready for the season, how the forest uh, responds to fires, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So again, we sure look forward to seeing you on April 24th. Same bat time. All right, last second questions. If not, I uh, bid you a fine rest of your evening and thank you on behalf of the Rio Grande National Forest and San Juan Mountains Association for joining us. Have a wonderful night.